Um, so thank you very much. Uh, so my talk is about life of a rejected patent, but before I give the talk, I thought maybe I'd just give you a small background to who I am so that it is contextually fits into my talk. Um, I have been in online video for close to like 15 to 18 years, and I know I'm dating myself when I say that. Uh, I started my career at George Lucas, uh, doing a lot of stuff on online video back, you know, during the times of Titanic, the Jurassic Park, and the Star Wars 1, and then subsequently worked at Fuji's Rocks Palo Alto Lab um, in, in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, taking care of uh, research patterns in the area of online video. Uh, so that kind of sets to uh, my tone to what I really want to talk, talk to you guys about today is uh, life of a rejected patent, how I adopted one, and the solution that I have actually uh, produced by that uh, adoption. Now, before I get into the talk of what we did with the patent that I got out of prison, as Patrick called it, uh, let's talk about what happens to a patent when it's actually created. When a patent is created, it gets calibrated or cataloged into three different areas. The first area of uh, categorization is that it is part of the core business, a patent that is the lifeline of a company. So in the case of, let's say, Google, a search patent would be the lifeline of its business. Without that patent, Google probably wouldn't be uh, the company it is today. Same thing applies to Facebook, so, so to a certain extent, with the news feed. Uh, now, this, this is a patent that receives a lot of love as soon as it's grown and as soon as it's, it's nurtured. There is a lot of things that's added to it as it moves into its infancy and, and towards its stages of advancement and maybe retirement at a later point of time when a better technology comes in and takes over. Now, the second category is a much more contentious category where a patent is used for bartering negotiations. So this is a form of stopping companies from countersuing each other. Now, let's take an example of what happened with Apple. Apple sued Google over Android because it infringed on the iOS patents. And, uh, you know, fast forward, Google acquires Motorola and acquires all its patents and countersues Apple. So now there is a Mexican standoff, two people pointing guns at each other. And uh, basically, uh, this is a form of bartering that happens all the time in big organizations, where a patent is not part of its core business, but it, it's en it ends up being used in order to further its core business anyway by this whole Mexican standoff thing. Now, we come to the third area, which is where you know, my story begins. In the third area, when a patent is born, it's neither core to the business, nor is it actually used in corporate bartering or negotiations. But it's a patent that big corporations don't really release to the wild. Instead, what happens is they end up capturing that, putting it into a patent vault, and then forgetting about it. Or worse, what really happens is that these patents get sold to patent trolls. Um, now, what is a patent troll? A patent troll is somebody who actually looks at patents from big organizations in most cases that are not useful to the organization, that's locked up. And then what these trolls do is they go to the big organizations and they basically say, hey, you know, you're using this patent. You probably don't have any use for it. How about I pay you some money today? And big orgs, you know, being this hierarchical system, looks at this and says, you know what? I have no revenues coming from this patent and I have to keep protecting it in order for me to actually, even if it's locked up. So why not I just sell it? And they sell it on a pennies to a patent troll. And the troll basically acquires this patent. The other way the patent trolls acquire patents is they look for companies that are going bankrupt or is bankrupt. And if these companies have a lot of patents, what they end up doing is they actually end up buying it cheap. Most companies that are bankrupt have a lot of creditors, you know, either it's a venture capitalist or banks. And obviously they've given them a lot of money and they want to recoup that. And one of the ways is to sell the patents and basically use that money to sell back to give the money back to the, uh, to the banking institutions. So what the troll does is they wait around and look for, a, you know, they wait in the dark and look for a startup or an idea that is coming around the corner. So in most cases, what happens is that a startup is actually either raised a lot of money or they're actually on the incline trying to really make it big in, 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 in their respective areas. And this is when the patent infringes. Patent trolls come in and basically throw a lawsuit. And in all cases, these lawsuits are settled in, uh, in, uh, with cash. And uh, this is cash that is probably would have gone for innovation uh, into the market. Or it would have actually even gone back into the research labs to actually make better ideas and better patents. But none of that happens. So my idea in order to counter the situation is that to create a patent exchange. A patent exchange is a place where I uh, where you know, companies that, are, uh, that have a lot of unused patents end up cataloging it and opening up to the entrepreneurs such as myself that can come in and actually take a look at these patents, look for ideas, 
validate the ideas, take them back to the corporations, in this case, big corporates who actually are license holders, and basically provide them a, uh, a vision as to what we can actually do with these patents. And once the patents are licensed out to an entrepreneur like myself, we go back to venture capital, pick up the money that is actually, provided, that is actually needed to take this product to market. And you know, this is basically enables a lot of innovation in the marketplace. And not only that, the researchers are very happy because this is something that they invented. And for them to see this go to market provides them valuable feedback so that they can actually do much more interesting and better things as they move on. And most of all, there's no trolling involved in this whole process. Uh, now, has this been done before? Yes, I have done this. And let's see by example as to how and what uh, happened. So let's look at the life of a patent, you know, 653639. This patent was born at Fuji Xerox. Fuji Xerox business, if you notice, is copy or printer business. The patent is in the area of consumer online video. Uh, Fuji Xerox doesn't do consumer business in the first place, and they don't really do anything with online video. So this patent gets rejected and put into a vault. And obviously, I'm an insider because I worked at the lab, so it was easy for me to go back and, you know, with an idea and basically say, uh, hey, Fuji Xerox, let's, let's release this patent. Let's take this to market. I have an idea as to how I can scale this product. Let me do it. And Fuji Xerox, being a forward-thinking company, licensed this patent to me. And then I was able to go back and garner other big organizations like Entity Docomo, like Samsung, and Turner Broadcasting. And we were able to actually come together and, and understand the idea that I had in mind and my vision in mind. And now we're looking at taking this patent to product and finding a product market fit. So now let's look at what this patent is and, and how is it actually enabling disruption in the consumer video space. Now, in most cases, everybody knows that, nobody knows that you're a dog on the internet. So let's take a look at our dog. And our dog is actually surfing the web, and it's in surfing the web to find interesting videos. And in this case, our dog obviously likes beautiful videos. So it's trying to look for uh, validation, surfing the internet, trying to look for videos that are interesting to the dog. Now, if you look at the internet today, the way that the video is actually advertised on the internet, it's one frame. And that one frame is an advertisement to the video. And in that one frame, in most cases, is misleading. So in this case, our dog looks at this beautiful video, clicks on it, and guess what happens? What happens is that the, the content behind the video is some cheesy guy selling infomercials. So it's called clickbait. It happens 40 plus percent on the internet, and all of you are at some time or the other, in fact, on a daily basis, are actually falling prey to this clickbait. And the reason the clickbait happens is because uh, video clicks is actually directionally, directly uh, relational to the publishers that can want to make money. So the minute you click on any particular video, you have all of these ads that show up, um, overlay ads on top of video, and this is how the publishers make money. And then there's nothing wrong with it, but the problem is that this is the only way for publishers to make money today. So basically, what the publishers are looking at is that frustrating people like you in order to actually uh, make their livelihood. Now, let's see how we're actually solving with this patent that, was, that I've adopted. Uh, every video, if you look at every video, it's a diverse set of visuals. Right? Each visual is basically in form, you know, a formation of clips. Clips make segments, segments make video. Now, when we, or the patent takes a, takes a look at all of these segments and provides important levels, so important factors. It says clip one is more important because it has certain motion in it. Clip two is more important because it's got some interesting imagery in it. And basically, once this importance is created by the patent, then the patent segments the video into a comic book. We call this the Japanese manga, and the product is called Videogram. So what the Videogram does is, it creates a pictorial summary of your video. So now, with one glance, you as a consumer are able to actually understand the context behind the video. There's no clickbaiting here. You, what you see is what you get, right? So now, let's take a look at the real example here. So this is how online video is today. Any site you go to, you basically have one frame, and there's a play button associated with the frame, and when you click it, surprise, you, know, you, you get to see whatever you get to see. There's absolutely no understanding of uh, what you're getting into before uh, you consume a video. So now the same, uh, same real estate, same format, let's see it changed into a videogram. So now this is a pictorial summary of the video. And this is a clear, clear indication to you as a consumer before you consume the video to see 
what it is that you're actually about to consume. And this is basically done by the patent that, that, that came out of uh, Fuji Xerox. Um, and uh, so this, not only that, and it actually gives you an indication of what is important in that particular video. And as you can see, there are certain frames that are larger, there are certain frames that are smaller. The larger frames, as per the patent, were more important than the smaller frames. And there's reasons behind it, uh, which probably is much more in-depth discussion of what the patent is all about. Now, as a consumer, you don't have to start the video from the beginning. There are interesting visuals here that might entice you, and you want to really start from that particular point of the video. So now you're able to actually navigate in and see, OK, this is the visual that I want to see. No. Then I come back and I say, oh, OK, this visual is more interesting to me, and I stop, and I get the second level summary of the video. So you have a complete uh, identification of what the video is, and when you start the video from that point, uh, and that point of interest, it actually starts to play the video from there. So you, as a consumer, have complete control now. And from the, con from the publisher perspective, you still have ads in there that you are actually showcasing. So the publishers are not losing money by going into this uh, platform. Now, the second issue is when you like a certain video, in most cases, you like a certain part of the video. It's a certain clip that you like, a certain iconic segment, a certain tagline. You're not able to actually communicate that freely to your social networks and to your, um, to your, uh, to your friends and families. So what this patent allows us to do is basically bookmark the point of interest that you really want to share, and then you're able to share that to Facebook. And when it goes to Facebook, this is how it looks in the Facebook newsfeed. There's a direct context to what you're trying to share. When, the, when your friend clicks on it, they consume the video from that point of time. So there's no clickbaiting. What you see is what you get. And, and it's, you know, it's very good for the publisher because they can actually throw contextual ads in there. Very good for the consumer because a lot more engagement. Now, more and more people are consuming videos on mobile these days, and this is how it looks in the Twitter feed. So even inside of the Twitter feed, we have this whole concept, whatever that you've seen so far as part of the product, embedded in. So you are able to basically consume content within the Twitter feed, and uh, there comes the ad right there. So the ad's not destroying your consumption experience, and the publishers are making money. As a consumer, you're also happy as well. So tying back together as to how we came about this, all of this came about from a rejected patent. And organizations, not only in Japan, but also elsewhere in other parts of the world, have tremendous amount of rejected patents that are actually going completely unused. And my plea is for these people to come together. If you are a corporate uh, licensee who happen to know that you have a lot of patents, or if you're an entrepreneur, or if you're a venture capital, come together and actually let's look at exploring these patent exchange ecosystem. And then together, uh, we can create um, innovations that are worth spreading. Thank you very much.